hey guys welcome back to another video in today's video we are going to be doing the physics paper 2 multiple choice extended this is the most recent paper this is the may june 2022 paper and uh, there will be 40 mcq questions that you have to solve in about 45 minutes so this is paper 2 variant 1 and uh, further ado let us begin this uh, paper so let's begin okay so the first question the first question usually talks about instruments, measurements, apparatus. Most likely it talks about um, the apparatus micrometer screw gauge. It's a very common one. Uh, it's almost always tested. So you are most likely going to expect to find this. So it says uh, in question one, it says which measuring device are most suitable for determining the length. Now length is usually determined in meters of a swimming pool and the thickness. The thickness would be the diameter of the aluminium foil so it is asking us which measuring devices the measuring devices would be also called apparatus okay and it's very important to know every apparatus in any science that you do okay so the measuring devices for the length of a pool a ruler will be too short for a length of a uh, of a swimming pool rulers usually typical about 100 centimeters that you need to know but a pool will be in meters because it's a pool right so hence why a ruler will be wrong so the two uh, options that we have are now b and c so we're going to always use the elimination method because that's the best method to solve these types of papers now a thickness a thickness a thickness is always measured using a micrometer screw gauge so the best apparatus most suitable apparatus because here it's saying most suitable would be the micrometer screw gauge because it says most suitable because of course you can use a ruler right and you know do you use so many rulers to measure the length but it is not most suitable hence why we use a micrometer screw gauge and a tape measure so the answer would be b we move on to the next question number two it says a man stands next to the railway track so we have a railway track he's standing right here and then the train is passing it says the train is traveling at this this meter per second is the speed and it takes two seconds which is the time taken to pass the man what is the length of the train now we know that speed is equal to distance over time and if speed is 40 meters per second the distance which we need to find and then the time which would be two seconds 40 times 2 which would be 80 meters the answer is simply 80 meters so just using one formula will get you the answer move on to the next question a speed time graph is used to determine the motion of an object which quantities are calculated from the gradient now when looking at gradient for a speed time graph we usually look at acceleration okay and the area under the graph we look at the distance traveled for the total time taken remember it's a speed time graph so it would be looking like this where we have speed here we will have time here so if you want to look at the total journey of time you'll just look at where the graph ends so you really can't look at the area under the graph you can only look at the distance traveled the acceleration if it's more steep that means it's accelerating more so by looking at the gradient we can determine the acceleration so the answer would be the gradient shows the acceleration and the area under the graph shows the distance traveled so the answer would be a number four it says on the moon all objects fall with the same acceleration which statement explains this now the reason for this first of all it's saying why do objects have the same acceleration on the move now we use the formula weight is equals to mg where weight is equals to mass times gravitational force where weight is directly proportional to the mass and this is the reason when mass is the same right the gravitational field strength on the moon is constantly 1.6 for igcse it is always 1.6 so the mass will of course be always the same of the object and hence why the the weight or the acceleration will always be the same for all the objects because the weight is directly proportional to the mass okay so if the mass increases the weight will also increase meaning the acceleration will also increase if you decrease the mass the acceleration will also decrease okay so the we're looking for something related to directly proportional to its mass so this would be the answer the meaning for directly proportional simply means if i increase one the other will also increase for inversely proportional if i increase one it does the opposite which maybe it would be decreased so hence why this would be wrong 
Uh, on the moon, all objects have the same weight. That is wrong. They don't have the same weight because the gravitational field strength is different. Uh, okay, sorry. The, the gravitational um, field strength is the same on the moon, but the objects have different masses. Okay, hence why. The moon has a smaller gravitational field strength than Earth. That is true, but it does not explain the statement. So that would be wrong. The gravitational field strength on the Earth is 10 Newton. It is, it is 10 Newton. Um, while on the, the moon, it is 1.6 Newton. Right. So the answer would be C for number four. Move on to the next question. Number five, it says a measuring cylinder contains 30 centimeter cubed of a liquid. So this would be the volume. Uh, some more of the liquid is added until the liquid level reaches a 50 centimeter mark. So from 30 centimeter cubed, it is going to 50 centimeters cubed. So you can see there's a change of 20 centimeters cubed. The next thing it's telling us the reading on the balance increases by 30 grams. So there is an increase of 30 grams. What is the density of the liquid? Now it's very important to look at the units. The units are in grams centimeter cubed. You can see here it's grams, here it's centimeters cubed. So we can use the formula. The formula for density, the formula for density is density is equals to mass over volume. So density here, which would be D, would be the mass. The mass would be 30 here and the volume would be 20. So if you use your calculator right now, which I'll use, and you should get an answer of 1.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Move on to the next question. The next question looks like it's about the centripetal force, um, but let's see. An object on the end of a string moves in a clockwise circular path at a constant speed. So it's going round like this, round and round. And the diagram shows the object as viewed from above. So we're looking at it from above. What is the direction of the resultant force? Now, the resultant force always acts at the center of where the object is. It is always acting on the object. Okay. It is always acting on the object. So that means the force will always act on the object. So the answer would be A. None of these forces would act that. But if we, re we stopped the speed, if we stopped, it would go in this direction. Okay. So if we let go, for example, we have a ball and we are throwing it in a circle as soon as we let go it would go in this path okay and the force is always acting on us or acting on whoever the person is rotating that ball so here the resultant force would always be a so the answer for number six is a we move on to number seven number seven it talks about the pivot and it talks about moment of a force but from the looks of the diagram so usually I always like to, before even solving the question, I look at what this question is about. So if it's about moment of a force, the first thing that comes into my mind is the formula for moment of a force. The, the, you know, the factors like the uh, clockwise is equals to anti-clockwise. So you already need to, you know, warm up your brain into what you are going to be thinking of. Like here, you don't think about uh, the formula of acceleration because it's not needed here. So, you know, you just... Tell your mind, this is what you need to look at. So when you're reading the question, you look at what specifically you're looking for. So number seven, it says a beam is pivoted at one end as shown. So we have a pivot here. We can even draw. Sometimes they don't draw it. So I like to draw it because, you know, it's just a, a more common way to draw these types of diagrams. It says the, beams, uh, the beam weighs six newtons and its weight acts at a, po at a point X, 40 centimeters from the pivot. So from the pivot to a point x it is 40 centimeters and then it says a force of four newtons is applied to the beam causing it to balance horizontally now you know in physics it's always good to visualize what you see right so how you do this type of question is for example take your pen okay you take your pen and you hold it where the pivot is so you would take your left hand and hold it at where the pivot shows in the diagram once you hold it if you if you just let it fall, the pen will fall downward. The pen will fall downwards, right? So if you want it to balance, if you want it to balance, you'll have to take your right hand and you'd lift it upwards, right? You would lift the pen upwards to make it balance horizontally. So that means that there will be a force upwards to make it balance. And here it's telling us that it's going to be of four newtons. So we know that it is vertically upwards to balance it. So it's either C or D. That one, you can just figure it out, right? And also we know the other fact that anti-clockwise, 
anti-clockwise moments is equal to clockwise moments. So this would be anti-clockwise, this would be clockwise. So if we do it, moment of a force is equal to the distance perpendicular times the force applied. So here it would be 40 times 6 is equal to 4 newtons times a certain amount here. So 40 times 6 would be 240 equals to 4 times the distance. And this would equal to 60 centimeters as the distance. So 60 centimeters from the pivot, okay, which would mean from X, it's only 20 centimeters more. Okay, so the answer here is, is 20 centimeters to the right of X. So the answer would be D. So it's quite straightforward right here. Okay, so that would make it balance. I'm hoping you are understanding that. Okay, number eight, it says on the diagram, what is the magnitude of the resultant force of the two vectors? Okay, so what is the magnitude of the, 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 the sort of, um, Two vectors so we have two vectors we have two vectors here and it's given us a scale which is two newtons so this distance here is two newtons right the distance from for example here to here would be two newtons isn't it so two newtons two newtons two newtons that would be six newtons right six newtons then eight newtons something like that right so it is asking us what is the resultant force now to calculate resultant force you look at the distance from all the way from this point to this point or you could draw a rectangle and do it from this point to this point. It's the same thing. You can measure with your ruler and then you multiply it by two to find the Newton scale. And you can see this will be five centimeters. So you multiply that by two and that would give you 10 Newtons. So the answer would be 10 Newtons for this. Number nine, it says three situations are listed. Number one, an object has a resultant force acting on it. Number two, a moving object experiences an impulse. Impulse is just a force, force that is um, per time. Uh, number three, it says an object is decelerating. In which situations is the momentum of the object changing? Okay, so here you can see they all are actually, look, an object has a resultant force. Now remember, what is momentum? Momentum. Momentum is actually mass times velocity. Mass times velocity. So anything that experiences mass times velocity will affect it. We also know that momentum, momentum is equals to impulse. So anything that affects impulse will also change the momentum. So you can see here, there's a resultant force. Resultant force is acting on it. If there's a force acting on it, impulse is equals to force times time. If there's force acting on it, the momentum will change. So of course we will need it. A moving object experiences an impulse. If an impulse is occurred, momentum changes. So we'll need this. An object is decelerating. If an object is decelerating, the velocity is, is constantly decreasing. The rate of change of velocity is decreasing. This velocity is decreasing and hence why momentum will also decrease. So all of these situations will affect momentum and hence why the answer will be one, two and three. Move on to the next question. The next question, it says a ball of mass 0 0.16 kg is moving forwards at a speed of 0 0.5 meter per second. A second ball of mass 0 0.10 kg is stationary. The first ball strikes the second ball. The second ball moves forward at the speed of 0 0.5 meters per second. What is the speed of the first ball after the collision? Okay, so we use a formula here whereby m1 v1 plus m2 v2 is equals to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. The reason why I'm using this is because there is the principle of momentum, which says that the momentum before the collision is equals to the momentum after the collisions. And to calculate momentum, we just simply add up the two momentums, right? So you do momentum one, momentum two, you add them together. So the total of momentum before the collision will always equal to the total momentum after the collision. So M1 here would be 0 0.16 kgs. I will multiply it by V1, which is 0 0.5. And because V2 is stationary, we will just M2 times zero will always be zero. So I'm just going to let it go like that. M1 V1 is simply just this. So, oh, sorry, uh, M1 is 0 0.16. V1 we have to find out because we have to find the speed of the first ball after the collision. And then M2 V2 would be 0 0.10 times um, 0 0.5. Okay, so it would become, now I'll use my calculator and I'll say 0 
times 0 0.5, which is 0 0.08, so 0 0.08, minus 0 0.10 times 0 0.5. So that would be minus 0 0.5. So this would be 0 0.03 is equals to 0 0.16 times V1. And I will just do 0 0.03 divide by 0 0.16, and I will get 0 0.1875, which is 0 0.1 9 as the answer so the answer is 0 0.19 here the thing that i used was the principle of momentum the principle of momentum always says that the momentum before the collision is always equals to the momentum after the collision despite the object right it's always the same let's move on to the next question number 11 number 11 says a mass hangs vertically from a spring uh, so as soon as you hear spring what comes to your mind? Spring, you hear elastic energy. Here you look at different types of energies. Here you look at Hooke's law. Here we look at force. Here we look at distance. So, you know, you just have to train your mind before even reading the question, before even reading what this question requires you to do. You know, this just goes to the back of your mind. You, you hear spring, you hear mass. You know, you just look at Hooke's law, you look at force, perpendicular. Uh, you know, all that type of stuff so that you're training your mind before or you're preparing your mind before you even do the question so that your mind knows what to specifically think of. So right now my mind is thinking, okay, Hooke's Law. You know, it's, uh, so another thing it would think about is, okay, distance, you know, uh, the length of the spring, you know, the mass of the spring, you increase the load, you know, so on and so forth. That's happening to, uh, you know, your mind. And that's how you train your mind. And that's the reason why you do so many past papers. It's that... You know, when you do so many past papers, you know, for example, like this, and then you do your exam in October, November, you do your exam next year, you see a question about spring, already your mind knows what, you know, you have to think about. So that's just the trick. That's the reason why you keep doing past papers. And yeah, so that's what I'm just thinking about. So I'll, I'll just, you know, talk to you about what my mind is thinking about, what I'm about to do next. And yeah, so let's read the next question. Uh, let's sorry, let's read the next sentence. Uh, the mass is raised to a point P and, and is then released. So we have a point P and we have this spring and I believe it is repeatedly oscillating from point P to point Q. So it is oscillating up and down from point P and Q. It then says which energies alternately increase and decrease throughout the oscillations. So let's look at the options. First, we just go through one by one. Gravitational potential energy. When do we need gravitational potential energy? When you drop an object. Why does that object fall down? It is because of the gravitational potential energy. The same way to this. Why is it falling down? Because of the gravitational potential energy. So we will need this. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy that is stored in moving object. In this case, the spring is moving. So we will also need this. Elastic energy is energy that is stored in a spring. The reason to why it oscillates is because of elastic energy. So we also need elastic energy. So, of course, A would be the answer. Uh, these ones, not only, so that's wrong here. We do not need internal energy. Internal energy is when you throw a ball into the ground. That internal energy is due to the compact. So that's wrong. Internal energy, wrong. Elastic energy, right. But uh, we need other energies too. Okay, we move on to number 12. Number 12 says a car has 620,000 uh, joules of kinetic energy. Uh, the car brakes and stops in a distance of 91 meters. What is the average braking force acting on the car? Now, another word for kinetic energy is work done. Okay, because work done is because of energy. We know that work done, okay, work done is equals to the distance, is equals to the distance times the force. Okay, now in this case, work done would be kinetic energy. So 620,000 is equals to 91 meters times the force. So if I do 620,000 divided by 91 both sides, I will get 6,800 newtons. So it's as simple as that. Uh, work done is equals to distance times force. Work done is caused because of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, remember, is on moving objects and hence why distance times force okay so the answer is c quite straightforward uh, number 13 it says the diagram shows a deep reservoir formed by a dam on what does the pressure at x depend now the factors that affect pressure first of all would be the shape would be the size would be the height you know stuff like that the more down you go the higher the pressure is in terms of shape if it is a large surface area 
right the pressure is less compared to you know something that is very thin the pressure is very little oh, sorry the pressure when it's big is more and here it would be less right so that's what you need to look at so uh, on what does the pressure x depend on the depth of course yes the depth because the lower you go down the more you go down the higher the pressure it works the same way in the sea if, or in the swimming pool if you go more down you know the reason why sometimes your 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 nose starts hurting the, when you go down when you dive down or is it nose or ears i don't know one of them hurts the reason is because of pressure due to the sudden change of pressure that your body cannot feel it's because of you going suddenly down you know your body cannot cope with that pressure the new pressure that is the reason why you know because the the deeper you go down the change in pressure and that's why your nose or ears hurt i don't know which one it is so it's one of those so that's the reason why okay i'm not know any biologist so yeah here we're doing physics that's all we need to know something hurts okay so so you go down one of the body parts hurts is because of pressure okay i think it's your nose uh yeah it should be your nose i think the reason so when you go down deeper because of the sudden change because you breathe through your nose yeah that makes more sense because you breathe through your nose uh that would be the reason why okay because of the sudden change in pressure we move on to number 14 number 14 looks like it's about volume it's about air so here you're talking about diffusion here you can talk about uh, you know air particles speed of air particles and so on and so forth okay so it says a sealed rigid container has a fixed volume the container is filled with air the container is then placed in a freezer cabinet and the temperature of the air in the container decreases so what affects um what affects particles what affects particles Something that affects particles is temperature. Another factor that affects uh, particles is the volume. So the tighter the volume, the more the faster the particles collide with. So here the temperature is falling, right? It's, it's decreasing. So what happens to the air in the container? The average distance of the particles will stay the same. The only time this will change is when the volume changes, right? The volume changes. If I make it a smaller, uh, smaller container, then it will decrease but here nothing like that is changing average speed of the particles decreases remember because of the kinetic energy when you decrease temperature the particles do not have enough kinetic energy this is like a bit of chemistry involved here but again physics too because we've done a um, we've done a, a topic of states of matter where gases we look at temperature and how it affects gases uh, in a container okay so the answer here would be uh, 14d okay so let's go that next question um i can already see evaporation 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 evaporate yeah so i know it's about evaporation things that come to mind factors that, uh, that affect evaporation and because i've seen two containers one with a wide you know water and one less already in my mind i say okay these are factors that are affecting evaporation but let's see now the factors that affect evaporation is temperature the wind speed the surface area uh, and stuff like that okay okay two open containers are filled with water at room temperature room temperature 20 degrees but doesn't matter the containers have different shapes uh, from which container does the water evaporate at a great greater rate and how can the rate of the evaporation be increased to if i want to increase evaporation i will increase one of these factors if i increase temperature yes if i increase wind yes if i increase surface area yes so which rate would the evaporation be greater in container one because of the surface area because it has a wider longest more surface area evaporation will be greater so the answer is either one one how can i increase this i can increase this by increasing the water temperature so the answer is b because if i increase temperature it will increase the evaporation rate so the answer is b move on i look at the thermometer stuff that looks at uh, stuff that comes into my mind factors affecting thermometers the bulb the sensitivity the capillary tube you know stuff like that is coming so i'm looking at something like that okay it says the student wishes to check the marking of the upper fixed point the upper fixed point and lower fixed points shows basically of a liquid what is the upper fixed point what is the max okay and what is the le uh, the least there is actually a test for this there's one to put in ice and there's one to put in boiling water so if i want to check upper fixed point i put it in boiling pure water because pure water will show that if it's 100 degrees then that is going to be my upper fixed point of the thermometer so put the bulb in the beaker of boiling pure water so that will be the answer uh, this one right here would be for lower 
fixed point it would show um, zero degrees right yeah let's go to number 17 water in a beaker gains thermal energy at a rate of 3000 watt okay so here is a it's a type of question which involves using converting those sentences into a formula okay it's another aspect another aspect that you need to learn in physics it's one of the most useful skills of physics converting the sentence into a formula you know if if you get that idea in with you it becomes so much easier okay so the water is at its boiling point the specific latent heat of uh, vaporization of water is this much how long does it take for 250 grams of water to vaporize now as i told you i think here we will need two formulas the first formula energy is equals to power times time look at here it says gains thermal energy at a rate rate is what time what is what power you see how i've converted energy equals to pt it's literally written here energy is equals to pt energy is equals to pt from this sentence i've derived the first formula second formula specific latent heat of vaporization we can say q is equals to ml it's the same for um yeah so q is equals to ml where q is the energy m is the mass l is the uh, specific latent heat of vaporization now i use these two formulas to find out how long it takes because i need to find this so what i can do here is because i know power and i know all this here i can find energy and then i'll do energy divided by p okay so q equals to ml q is what i need to find out right so mass is 250 grams 250 times 2260 what will this give me i'm going to use my calculator again 250 times 2260 will give us um five six five thousand this is energy okay so i can even say joules and then dividing this with power so divide this by 3000 if i divide this by 3000 i am getting 188.3 seconds so this would be the closest in three significant figures so the answer will be b move on to the next question number 18 it says a glass contains an iced drink on a warm and humid day water starts to form on the outside of the glass okay uh, what is the name of this effect now water is forming because it's humid and it's at the outside part this is because of condensation the same reason to why a tent for example when you wake up early morning if you're in a tent and there is water on the tent the reason is because of condensation the reason is because of condensation so the same way the water is actually inside not outside but it's because of condensation that is going to make it into water the gas becomes water right yeah because of the iced drink in a warm day the same way a tent in a warm day the tent has been throughout the night where it was cold and then suddenly it becomes a warm day condensation happens okay Con condensation happens Number 19, it says one end of a copper bar is heated to a high temperature. Which mechanism is responsible for the transfer of thermal energy to the other end of the copper bar? Now, thermal energy is transported through the vibrations of ions, vibration, vibration of ions and movement of energy. So we're looking at something like that and I can already see B is the right answer. This is correct, but not only. So that's wrong. Movement of high energy, not only, so this is wrong. Movement of high energy copper ions, there's no movement of ions. There's never movement of ions. Even in chemistry, there's never movement of ions. It's always vibration of ions along a bar. Okay, so the answer would be B. Number 20, it says the diagram shows a convection current caused by a piece of ice placed in a beaker of water at room temperature. So convection of current, we know that here it will be colder compared to here. Here it will be hotter. Okay, of the ice, so it goes up and down. The hot air always rises, the same to air. Hot air rises, the cold air sinks. So let's see here. Uh, higher than at Q, uh, at point P, higher than at Q, that's wrong. It should be lower. Wait, is it? Uh, yeah, 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 so even this becomes wrong, right? Um, so at P, lower than Q, that's correct, that's correct. Density at P, so the density at P, the density at P would be um higher than at q because remember dense will fall so it'll be like that so the density always falls more dense will fall right so the answer is c
We move on to question 21. The diagram shows a wave. So we have a wave here. And it says which row is correct. So we have displacement and which row is correct. Okay, so amplitude, amplitude. We know amplitude is this much. This is the amplitude. So the amplitude in this case uh, would be 1. So from 0 to here, it would be 1. So it's either these two. And the wavelength is from one successive point to the other successive point. So if I pick this point, 1, 2. Okay, so 1, 2. So the same point in the next uh, wave. So the answer would be 8, right? So the answer would be B, 21, B. Okay, we move on to question 22. Question 22 says, A sound wave is created by a loudspeaker that vibrates backwards and forwards 96,000 times per minute. The sound of uh, the speed of sound is 320 meters per second. What is the wavelength? Now, we know the formula here. Speed is equal to frequency times the wavelength. Frequency is always defined per second. So it would be 96,000 per second. So if it is 96,000 per minute, we use our calculator to 96,000 divide by 60. So it would be about 1600 per second. 1600 seconds. 1600 per second. So that would mean the speed which would be 320 and the frequency which would be 1600 times the wavelength. If I do 320 divide by 1600, I will get 0 0.2 meters. So the wavelength will be 0 0.2 meters. Move on to uh, another question. Now, 23, it says a card is placed in front of a plane mirror so that its label is facing the mirror as shown. The label is shown. How does the image of the label being formed? Now, a trick to this is if you flip your paper in the exam, right, and you see how the image is formed, that would be the answer. So if I would flip the paper hypothetically, right, of course, I can't do it online. If you check the back of the paper, if you see that print, it would be something like it would be something like this. I and then uh, I'm trying to as it's like this, I think I see or, or something like that. I and then no, it would be the other way. Right. It would be like like this so the trick to this question is just flip your paper and you'll see uh, the answer right so the answer would be this it will just flip okay so turn your paper around and you'll see how the object would be viewed so the answer is C number 24 it says a thin converging lens can produce both real and virtual images which road describes a real and a virtual image now a virtual image okay what's the definition of a virtual image the definition of a virtual image is that it cannot be projected cannot be projected on screen cannot be projected on screen and and the definition of a real image is it can be projected on the screen okay and to form a real image right to form a real image they converge converge is join right they converge to form an image so the answer would be b right the answer would be b simple quite straightforward the speed of light in air is this much. The critical angle for light in transparent plastic material placed in the air is 37 degrees. What is the speed of light in the plastic material? Now, here we are being we have been given um, the critical angle for light is this. We have been given the critical angle. Okay, and we have also been given the speed of light. So we know that n is equal to 1 over sine c isn't it 1 over sine c c being the critical angle so if i do 1 over sine where is it 1 over sine 37 would be about 1.6 1.66 okay 1.66 now with that knowledge now if i, I have identified once i've identified um my critical uh, sorry once i've identified my um my refractive index so uh i would 1.66 is going to be my refractive index i can use this formula which is the formula that we use in a medium where n is equal to the speed of light in air times the speed of light in that plastic material so it'll be x here so 1.66 times x is equals to 3 times 10 to the power 8 so I divide this and I'll get a long number like 18750000, which would simply just be 1.8 times 10 to the power 8. So the answer is A. Yeah, so refractive index first, and then you would use the other formula. 
Okay, number 26, it says, which part of the electromagnetic spectrum is used by a remote controller for the television? Now, this is just straightforward. We use this in remotes. We know this. It is infrared waves. Uh, none of the others. Not microwaves, not radio waves, not visible light. Just, uh, if you want to go over all the uses, just go through the theory. Look at the uses of each of the following. You will get to know much better like that. Number 27, it says, which statement correctly compares radio waves with X-ray waves? Now, radio waves and X-rays are both in the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you go to the electromagnetic spectrum, okay. Uh, I'm trying to remember, what is it? Um, yeah, so, okay. Now, the, the spectrum, okay, the electromagnetic spectrum, right? I can actually even pull up a Google image. What you have to remember here is that the radio waves, okay, which is uh, always you start off with the radio waves, right? So the radio waves always have the longest wavelength. It has the longest wavelength in the entire spectrum, okay? It has the most spectrum, okay? And the speed of each of them is always 3 times 10 to the power 8. It's always the same, okay? The same speed in the thing. So what compares the radio waves have a longer wavelength, okay? So it's, I think, it's like this. Yeah, so, so you know, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, uh, so on and so forth, right? Then X-rays and gamma rays. So you can see X-rays is right here, okay? There must be a mnemonic, I don't really have a mnemonic, for this, I think Roman men, uh, there's something like that, but I don't really remember through uh, mnemonics. That's why I just didn't, um, you know, teach you any mnemonics. So maybe there's a mnemonic, you can find it out, but I would advise you, you know, if you can just remember the letters, it's better because you will need this uh, as you go on. Okay, so that's the electromagnetic spectrum. Number 28, it says, a student counts how many iron pins an electromagnet picks up when the power supply is switched on, and then she counts how many pins are picked up when the power supply is switched off. So when it's on, when it's off. She repeats the experiment using cores made of different materials, the results are shown. The pins picked up uh, the power supply. When the power supply is on, okay, when the power supply is on, we have the iron pins. Okay, and we can see that there are like uh, a few iron pins that are, are there. So when it's on, because it is a, where is it written? It is in soft iron. The definition of soft iron is it can easily be magnetized and demagnetized. I switch on the power, it's magnetized. I switch, off, switch it off, it's fully off, okay? So the answer to this would be, when I switch it on, it's going to get all the pins. When I switch it off, it's gonna get zero pins. So that's why, which core is made out of soft iron? This one, okay? The one where when you pick it, it's 12. When you switch it off, it's zero. When it's a hard iron, it is hard to demagnetize, hard to magnetize. So once it magnetizes, it will not lose its magnetism easily. Okay, that's the difference between soft iron and hard iron. Okay, so that is the, the difference. Number 29, it says a plastic rod is brought near to a small plastic sphere suspended from a stand. The sphere is repelled by the rod. Why is this? Now, if it's repelled by the rod, okay, it's repelled by the rod. This is because it has like charges, just like a magnet, like charges will repair. So the answer will just simply be A. Unlike will attract, meaning they'll come together. And then these are just wrong, Char it can't be unchanged, yeah. So it's like charges, that's the reason why it would repel. Okay, number 30, which unit is equivalent to a volt? Volt, now, the definition, actually, if you do electromotive force, uh, it's there in part of the definition. A volt is also another uh, definition of that is JC, and you know this through the electro uh, electro. Uh, motive forces. So the definition of electromotive force, you can get to know uh, why they are the same, okay? Because of a uh, joule uh, that keeps circulating per second over the circuit, okay? That's the reason why. We move on to the next question. Next question is question 31, which says a resistor converts 360 joules of energy uh, when there is a current of 3 amperes in it. The potential difference across the resistor is 6 volts. For how long is there uh, this current in the resistor. Again, this is an application of converting a sentence into a formula. We're being given energy, we're being given current, we're being given voltage. 
and we know that energy is equals to power times time where energy where power equals to iv so ivt so if energy equals to 360 which i have blocked it but it's 360 is equals to the current which is 3 and voltage which is 6 times the current uh, sorry times the time which we don't know so 360 divided by 18 equals to the time which equals to 20 seconds quite straightforward here we use the formula and you get your answer the next question it says the four circuits are this the four circuits um one second yeah okay the four circuits shown each contain four diodes in which circuit is the direction of the current in the resistor always from the red terminal to the black terminal so a diode uh, always travels in one direction so if the current is for example going through here it will go in this direction and then enter the red terminal and then get out of the red terminal so it's a loop that is always entering from the red terminal to the black terminal so the answer is a why is it not b okay it goes this way it goes this way and it enters the black terminal first it has to always enter from the red terminal so this is wrong in this case the current goes here the current goes here the current goes here the current goes here it will never enter at any of the terminals so this is wrong so here the current goes this way the current will go this way it will enter the black terminal and then enter the red terminal so here it's because uh, here it's because uh, no sorry wait one second one second yeah, yeah sorry yeah so here it will never enter any of the terminals again it will never enter any of the terminals so this is wrong so the answer is a over to the next question the diagram shows a circuit of six identical lamps connected to a battery which lamp is the brightest so if the current is coming through this way for example um if the current is coming through this way it will consume more in p and then it will split okay it will split into qr and then again split further so this one will be the least brightest then second least brightest this will be the most brightest so p will be the most brightest lamp okay 34 a digital circuit is made out of two logic gates which row is correct for this digit circuit okay let's see so this is an or gate this is a not gate okay so the or gate is called an addition now if you do computer science with me uh, i usually call these types of gates addi addition gates multiplication gates what i mean with an or gate w and x we add the values we add the values to get the new value so i'm adding these values so 0 plus 0 is not 1 so this is the first the first one is wrong 0 plus 1 is again not 0 so this is wrong 1 plus 0 is 1 that is correct and then that becomes this so it looks like the answer is 34 c here 1 plus 1 is not 0 so here it's wrong so the answer is c so the or gate is the addition gate the not gate is the opposite gate so meaning if it's 1 here z will be 0 it's opposite okay so that's how i i try to understand it like that a magnet is dropped vertically through a solenoid. This induces magnetic poles at both ends of the solenoid. Uh, the magnetic poles are induced at position X in the diagram 1 and diagram 3. Okay, so what happens in diagram 1? So diagram 1 is going this way, right? It's going downwards, okay? So it's going downwards, okay? Because it's going downwards, you see this south pole is the one that is getting induced. In this case, right, in this case, it would be the north pole that is getting induced because it's leaving the circuit. So whatever is left, whatever enters is what it is. So diagram one is S, diagram three is north. So the answer is C, very straightforward. Okay, number 36, which transformer can change as 240 volts AC input into 15 VAC? Which transformer can do this? Okay, so we have 800 turns, we have 40 turns. Uh, we know the formula, uh, 800 divided by 40, 240 divided by 15. Okay, we're looking at which transformer will do the following. Okay, which will do the following. So the formula here that you need to know is that if it's primary, so it's changing from 240 to 15, right? It's changing from 240 to 15. So what we're going to do here is we have to look at which transformer can change 240 volts into 15 volts so which one has the same output right? which one has the same output 
So it's quite simple. What you simply have to do is you have to look at which one equals the same. So if we do 240 divided by 15, we will get 16. And if we do, let's see, now we're going to just divide everything. 800 divided by 40 is 20. So this is wrong. We need something 16. Uh, 1000 divided by 25 is 40. So again, this is wrong. 2400 divided by 15 is 160. So this is wrong. So the answer would be this. But let's just confirm it. 1200 divided by 75 is equals to 16. So you can see this is 16. This is 16. So the answer is D. Number 37, it says, what is the purpose of a split ring commutator? Now, the purpose of a split ring commutator is simply so that the uh, the motor always stays in the same direction. So let's see. Magnetic field, nope, nope. Turning effect changes direction. It does not change direction. It has to stay in the same direction. Answer is D. Straightforward. How do the sizes of the two nuclei produced in a nuclear fission reaction compare to the size of the original nucleus? Now, this is um, a type of odd question. Usually, you don't see this in textbooks and so on and so forth, right? So what you need to know here is that the two nuclei that is produced in nuclear fission is always smaller. Okay, it is smaller than the original nucleus. Okay, so these two nuclei in nuclear fission, nuclear fission is when they break, nuclear fusion is when they join. So when they break, it of course becomes smaller. So the answer is smaller. So we have one big unit, it becomes two small boxes. An example would be like this. So it becomes smaller. Uh, 39, it says, which statement about the radioactive uh, decay of a substance is correct? Okay, let's see. It cannot be predicted when a particular nucleus will decay. Yeah, that is right. Yeah, that's right. You will never predict when a particular nucleus will decay. It can decay anytime. There are various factors. And yeah, that is true. So that would be the answer. Number 40, last question. The diagram shows a stream of beta particles traveling in a line that passes through between the poles of a magnet. In which direction? Now, beta particles okay they always go out of the page now how you do this is you use the left hand rule and if you put your now this would be hard to show through paper i mean through online but it will simply go out of the page okay it will simply go out of the page actually it's a right hand right it's right hand so if you put your right hand where your index finger is you would uh, align it with this. So it would be something like this. Uh, let's see if I'm, I can draw it. So this is your, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to draw it. Th this is my thumb. So this is my thumb. And you can see it is pointing upwards. If it's pointing upwards, it's going to be out of the page. This right here is my index finger. Index finger is pointing to the direction of the beta particles. And this right here, my middle finger is pointing from north to south okay it's pointing from north to south okay so it's as simple as that sorry it's a left hand rule yeah i just remember my diagram was wrong so left hand rule so using left hand rule um let me show you how it's it's going to be do it's like this Okay, so that was how it would look. Of course, then you have your hand and stuff. So terrible drawing. This is why I didn't take out. But yeah, so what happens here? Your thumb will be pointing upwards. If it points upwards, that means the direction is out of the page. Okay, your index finger will point the direction of the beta particles. And then your middle finger will point from north to south, always north to south. So that would mean it is out of the page. So that marks the end of today's video. And uh, I am hoping to make more May, June past paper videos. Uh, I uploaded one for chemistry, so if you do chemistry, go check that one out. I uh, uploaded it yesterday. So that would mark the end of the physics one. And I, I am hoping you understood all the questions. It was a fairly easy paper. And uh, I think we also finished in time even after all this explanation. So that just shows it's very easy. It was an easy paper. So hopefully you understood the questions. And if you have any questions, comment down below. If you need any help, Instagram is always there. You can message me on Instagram at IGCSC online. So with that being said, um, thank you guys for watching this video and I will see you in the next video.